begin, I'd like to thank my artistic friends, Jim Miller and Russell Smith, Steve Anderson, Bob Pearson, Robert Carr, Mark Postlethwaite, Harry Dempsey, and Ray Rimmel for allowing me to enhance this presentation with their magnificent work. I'm also grateful to Rainer Absmeyer for allowing me the use of his wonderful photos. Yad Geshvater III, or much more simply, JG3, was a large unit that included at least 35 aces and scored about 370 victories. So I obviously can't present a complete history of the unit here today. So I decided to concentrate on just a few of the most interesting personalities. And as I said, this is a wonderful painting by Brian Knight from Ray Rimmel's Fokker D7 Anthology II, used with his permission. It's a marvelous depiction of the black and white Fokkers of Yasta 26. And this is a group photo of some of the airmen of JG3. You can probably spot Herman Goring right there. Boo. Okay. <laughs> Many of these pilots were highly skilled fighter aces, obviously, but what struck me about them was that they possessed a high survival rate in comparison to similar units. A high percentage lived through the war, uh, unfortunately, in the case of Goring, and some survived some very harrowing combats and injuries. So what was a Yad Geshvater? And, and I know this is old hat to a lot of you. Put simply, a Yad Geshvater was what we would today call a fighter wing. It was a permanent grouping of four smaller units, the fighter squadrons known as Yadstaffeln or Yastas. Each of those four squadrons retained its own commander, but they were all under a single leader known as the Geshvater commander. This commander led the wing both on the ground and in the air, had to be a regular army officer, a skilled administrator, as well as an accomplished fighter pilot and a formation leader. And those guys were hard to find. The JG was directly responsible to the army headquarters of the specific army to which it was assigned. The JGs were instruments of aerial superiority. They were elite units and highly mobile. They were always to be found wherever the fighting was hottest on the Western Front. And this artwork is by Robert Carr from Ray Rimmel's book, Fokker DR-1 Yagstaffel. Well, what was the model? The first Yad Geshvater, as many of you know, the famous JG-1, was formed in June 1917, commanded by the Red Baron himself, composed of Yastas 4, 6, 10, and 11. The success of that outfit led to the later formation of JG-2 and 3. This photo was taken to record Richthofen along with the commanders of the four squadrons that composed JG-1 in about March 1918. And from left we have Kurt Wustow of Yasta 4, Wilhelm Reinhardt of Yasta 6, the Rittmeister in the center, Erich Lovenhardt of Yasta 10, and the Red Baron's brother Lothar, commander of Yasta 11. Of this group of five, only two would survive the war, Kurt Wustow and Lothar von Richthofen, and many of you know they were both severely wounded. It was what we call a high-risk occupation. In early 1918, Germany was planning to launch a series of massive offensives starting on the 21st of March. The Great Spring Offensive was an attempt to defeat the Allies before the overwhelming impact and resources of the United States could come into play. For the first offensive, known as in English Operation Michael or Mikael, three offensive armies would be employed, the 2nd, the 17th, and the 18th. Those are going to be the main armies in the offensive. It was decided that each of the attacking armies would need its own JG unit, along naturally with many other aviation units. And this led to the creation of JG-2 and JG-3 on the 2nd of February 1918. JG-3 was destined to be assigned to the 17th Army, at least at first. Okay, never mind. Okay. Our topic today, then, is JG-3. JG-1 and JG-2 both went through three different commanders in the course of their history due to combat deaths and injuries. However, JG-3 was unique among the three primary Army JGs in that it had only one commander who survived throughout its existence. 
That was Oberleutnant Bruno Lurzer, the successful 27-year-old fighter ace who had commanded Yasta 26. He had flown at the front since the very beginning of the war. By the time he was appointed to lead JG-3, he had acquired 20 victories. In early 1918, he began the task of forming the new wing in Flanders in the German 4th Army. It would soon be transferred to the 17th Army. His old Yasta 26 would form part of the new wing and was joined by the, Yast the legendary Yasta Belka in Yastas 27 and 36. Lurzer's 20 victories qualified him for the famous Orden pour le Merit, or the Blue Max, as it's generally known, just as he was forming up JG3. On a chilly 12th of February, Lurzer received the medal in its red box from the hands of the Kaiser himself. Of course, there he is. And I'm very grateful to Lance Brunnenkamp for providing this superb photo. Now, I'm not here today to try to glamorize Bruno Lurzer. Most of you know that he was an old friend and crony of Hermann Goering. And in fact, their two careers in World War I were so closely intertwined, you can't really talk about one without talking about the other. His lifelong relationship with Goering does not in itself speak well of Lurzer. However, it is true that in World War I, Lurzer was a highly efficient and competent formation leader, affable, highly respected by his men. He led JG3 by example and flew into combat at the head of his old Yasta 26. During his nine months as JG3 leader, he more than doubled his score to 44 victories. His famous D7 was marked in the colors of Yasta 26, and the distinctive markings on the upper wing were designed so that everyone in a large Geschwader formation could pick out the wing leader. And we'll next look at each of the four component Yastas that made up JG3. Yasta Bulka, or Yasta 2, was originally formed as Yasta 2 in August 1916. Its first commander was, of course, the legendary Os Oswald Bulka. This is the unit in which many celebrated aces got their start, including Manfred von Richthofen and Ferner Voss. After Bölke's death, it was renamed Yasta Bölke in his honor, sometimes much more simply just Yasta B. No other fighter squadron in the German air service possessed such a proud heritage and as much prestige. By the time JG3 was formed, and this photo was taken, and it, uh, the, the Yasta Bölke was back in top form after it had had a bit of a rough patch. It was now commanded by the able Oberleutnant Karl Bola in the center in the white hat in front, equipped with the latest Fokker triplanes. Now, I love this photo. This group of young pilots, to me, just exudes confidence and panache and esprit de corps. Uh, you'll note the stylish walking sticks. They were gifts from Anthony Fokker, made from broken propellers. And uh, the collective, you may notice, this is the famous ace Powell Boimer, who would also earn the Blue Max. The collective score of the 10 men in this photo would eventually be over 130 victories. But perhaps even more impressive is the fact that only two of them failed to survive the war. At the formation of JG3, Yasta Bolka had amassed an impressive 197 victories. And that would increase to 336 by the war's end. This was second only to the top scoring Yasta 11 with 350. In all, 10 pilots who flew in Yasta Bolka at one time or another received the Blue Max, and the half white, half black tail planes and the engine cowling made up the unit markings of the, of the Yasta at this time. And the art is by Bob Pearson, again from Rimmel's Fokker DR1 Jagdstaffel, as are the three other similar pieces that follow. Well, next is Yasta 26. Uh, this, is, this shows the unit shortly after the formation of JG-3. In the center is Bruno Lurzer, the commander of JG-3. Uh, after he was appointed to the command of JG-3, he relinquished leadership of the Yasta and named his younger brother Fritz as the commander of, of Yasta 26 as its leader. This was not just a case of nepotism, because Fritz was an accomplished fighter ace and a very competent and skilled leader in his own right. He proved a very competent uh, Yasta commander. At the time it was incorporated into JG3, Yasta 26 had about 75 victories. 
And as I said, Bruno Lartzer continued to fly with this unit when he led JG-3 into combat. The very distinctive unit markings of this squadron were the broad black and white bands on the fuselage and tail, very recognizable to both friend and foe. This unit would score about 100 more victories during its time in JG-3. Well, next is Yasta 27, which was commanded by Bruno Lartzer's close friend, Hermann Goering. I'm not going to devote much time to Goering today. Peter Kilduff's suburb book has already covered his World War I career in detail. Goering had flown as a fighter pilot in Yasta 26 under Lortzer's command in 1917. After seven victories of his own, he was appointed to lead Yasta 27 in May. He's seen here in front of his triplane addressing his pilots of Yasta 27. Yasta 27 remained closely associated with Yasta 26. The two units often shared the same airfield. By the time JG-3 was formed, Yasta 27's aircraft displayed yellow tails, yellow struts, and engine cowlings. At, the time, Yasta at that time, Yasta 27 had 43 victories, but it increased to at least 177 by the war's end. And fourth is Yasta 36, which was led by the formidable Heinrich Bongartz. And he's in the center there with the Corps de Marie. You may not be too familiar with Bongartz or with Yasta 36, which is why I plan to devote a little more time to them today. Yasta 36 is one of the first two units in the 4th Army selected to receive a full complement of Fokker triplanes and to be chosen for JG-3. And again, Bongartz was a tall man, an impressive figure, a kind of an imposing figure. Yasta 36 had already amassed 88 victories when JG-3 was formed. That's twice as many as Goering's Yasta 27. In October 1917, in just one month, it had chalked up 25 victories without a single casualty. Bongartz had earned his own Blue Max in December 1917, even before Bruno Lerzer. The Staffel was known as the Blue Noses by both its own pilots and its British opponents due to its unit market. Also note the large iron cross painted on the tailplane. When the DR-1 entered service, there was still some concern that it might be confused with the Sopwith triplane by other German airmen. That did actually happen a few times. The display of the cross on the tailplane was meant to facilitate identification. This became a de facto unit marking for Yasta 36 triplanes, along with the blue nose. In preparations for the Great Spring Offensive increased, the now complete JG-3 was transferred to the 17th Army. The move was made in as much secrecy as possible. This rare photo of Yasta 36 triplanes was probably taken in early April 1918. You'll note the variety of cross insignia as the change to the new Balkenkreuz format was still in progress. The crosses on the tailplane show up quite well. The pilot's personal markings were painted on the fuselage. And, okay, the Great Spring Offensive erupted on the 21st of March. This was the biggest effort Germany made in the war, and they made more advances than any other time since 1914. Lortzer and his JG-3 pilots were in the thick of it. In the six days between the 22nd and the 27th, JG-3 pilots were credited with 20 British aircraft. Yasta 26 did not as yet have Fokker triplanes, was still flying Albatross D-5s. Nonetheless, on the 22nd and 23rd, the Lortzer brothers downed three Sopwith camels between them. Heinrich Bongartz also shot down a camel on the 23rd and two more planes on the 27th. He'd served in the infantry and earned his commission at Verdun, was apparently wounded in mid-1916. He transferred to the air service in the same year and was posted to Feldflieger Abteilung 5. There, his commander, Hauptmann Kruger, wrote this in his evaluation. A dead certain candidate for the Port Le Merite, if his audacity does not get him shot down first. <laughs> Both parts of that assessment were to prove very prophetic. As a charter member of Yasta 36, he soon notched up 11 victories before he was wounded in the arm in a scrap with British two-seaters on July 13th. He returned two months later and then quickened his scoring pace. Now, in a post-war German newspaper account, it says he was known as the Lion of Flanders. I've not seen that confirmed anywhere else, but 
Sure sounds cool. His accomplishments made his name familiar to his British opponents as well as to his own side. I'm sure many of you have read the wonderful book by the 56 squadron ace James McCudden and will know of his tales of a skilled German flyer they were always meeting that they called Green Tail, right? Well, historian Alex Revel told me that at least one 56 squadron pilot, Jeffrey Bowman, thought that Green Tail must be Bongard's. It wasn't true, of course, but it does show how respected and well-known Bongard's was. He was a tall man, not fat, but bull-necked and broad-chested. And on March 30th, Bongard's Fokker triplane suffered the breakup of the entire leading edge of its upper wing. Historian Alex Emery stated that on this day, Bongard's was slightly wounded by a burst of flak, although it's not certain whether or not that same shell burst caused the damage to the upper wing. As you can see, the entire fabric covering of the upper wing became slack, and a section of the leading edge plywood got trapped in the uh, center section struts. Bongard still managed to bring his triplane down for a safe landing behind the German lines. His wound was slight, and he did not leave the, leave the front. Eighteen days later, JG-3 resumed its nomadic existence and relocated to airfields around Halloween in Flanders, back in the 4th Army to take part in the battle for Mount Kemmel. This rare photo shows Jasta 36 triplanes in the process of being reassembled at their new airfield. During a big move, the aircraft were often disassembled and shipped to the new location by rail when circumstances permitted to save wear and tear on the aircraft. Pay particular attention to this one right there. Because that particular DR-1 was rather interesting, and this is a new photo. I focused on this particular Yasta 36 triplane. Jim Miller kindly produced this superb color profile for this presentation. The arrow on the fuselage was the personal marking of the unknown pilot, and it seems like the blue nose unit color may have been extended to the wheel covers. Having achieved 33 victories, Bongartz would make his last flight on the 29th of April. The triplane is not known to have been his, but it is a Yasta 36 triplane from this period. Notice this is probably one of the last photos taken of Bongartz from exclusively the left side. On April 29th, Bongartz was flying DR-157517. You can note that down, Lloyd. He became separated from his own squadron in the heavy clouds, but soon found that his Yasta Bolka friend, Paul Boimer, was also flying. These are representations of Bongartz's triplane here and Boimer's triplane of Yasta Bolka right there. Years later, Bongartz wrote a very colorful account of his day, which is worth quoting in full. However, any of you that are a bit squeamish may want to cover your ears. Quote, I therefore waved to my closer countryman, Paul Boimer, and buzzed with him toward the front. There was a firm understanding between the two of us that when we were flying together, one would attack and the other one would provide protection. Boimer had quickly discovered an English infantry cooperation plane circling at a low height, which was calmly patrolling along our lines. He dove down upon him with me trailing behind him. However, after a few rounds, Boimer eased off his opponent, in the meantime making a signal toward me, which I interpreted as a jammed machine gun. It was a fateful mistake. In reality, Boimer had by chance discovered through a hole in the clouds a flight of enemy fighter planes which I could not see. Immediately after Boimer's signal, I therefore attached, attacked the English plane without concern and whispered a little saying about his ears from both guns. Despite the clattering and hammering of the motor and firing pins, I suddenly noticed that I myself was being heavily fired upon. The situation was quickly grasped, unquote, and the British fighter planes were SE-5s from the famous 74 Squadron, led by none other than Mick Manick. Quote, Eight Englishmen were popping away at me, resulting in ricochets from the metal parts of the machine, whistling about my nose in a nasty way. Afterwards, it was de determined, for example, that no fewer than 38 rounds had hit the engine housing alone. Boimer, my faithful comrade, turned from a curve toward the Englishman in order to take the heat off of me. I, too, put my Fokker triplane into a sharp turn 
as I wanted to get out of the enemy's field of fire. Then I felt a blow to my left temple, and at the same time experienced a burning sensation and flickering before my eyes. My goggles slid away. Glass splinters were stuck to my face. I could no longer see anything, and a hot stream of blood poured over my nose and mouth. A crazy, indescribable pain tore my cranial nerves apart, and for a moment I almost lost consciousness. But the awareness of the great danger in which I found myself overcame the piercing pain and all feelings of weakness. I had to land at any price. I could not touch my left eye. I could no longer breathe for all the torturous pain. However, with my glove, I was able to free my right eye of blood. While on the left side, I tried desperately to shut my eye in order to stem the stream of blood. All things considered, my last landing at the front was not bad at all. I set the machine down in a field of craters on Mount Kemmel. Well, besides Bongartz's own story, we're very lucky to have the account of an infantry officer eyewitness who was nearby. And I'll, I'll quote him first. This afternoon, a Fokker triplane came down and flipped over. The pilot crawled out from under it, covered in blood, and with his left eye shot out. He first walked around his aircraft, took a look at it, and then came toward us with his eye hanging down. He introduced himself with a bow, Heinrich Bongart. <laughs> he introduced himself with a bow. We bandaged him up, and I immediately ordered a car. He was in terrible pain as the round had passed through his temple and lodged in his nose, for which reason he could not get any air through his nose. In addition, he simply said, Ya, ya, we all take our turn. <laughs> the airplane was totally shot up and spattered with blood. With this frightful wound, he was still able to land and walk, but not for long. He received a morphine injection, and then he lay quite still. Now, for a different perspective, we go back to Bongartz's own exaggerated account. Quote, blood was flowing from my temple, my nose, and my mouth. An infantry officer came toward me from a command dugout. I introduced myself to him. Oh, whoa, he lamented in my stead, as it were. What do you have there on your face? <laughs> Where, I asked in reply, and noticed that something was dangling on my left cheek. I grabbed it, and I myself tore off the eye which was hanging by a sinew from its smashed socket. That finished me off, and I collapsed unconscious. Yeah. Well, Bongartz had apparently been shot by Captain C.B. Glenn of 74 Squadron, who would go on to earn seven more victories. Although his war was over, Bongartz survived. Now, these are before and after photos, and we've seen that one before, but this is Bongartz with the eye patch. This is about two or three months after he was wounded. And uh, with his close friend, Paul Boimer. Boimer himself had been injured in a crash in late May, and the comrades had been recuperating together in a hospital in Dusseldorf. And note how Bongartz's tunic just kind of hangs on him, and he appears rather gaunt, obviously due to his long, difficult convalescence. And here's Bongartz at extreme right about two or three months later in October or early November 1918 at the fighter trials in Adlershof, which he attended with many other famous airmen. Here's Bongartz, then Goring, then Paul Boimer again. This is Bruno Lertzer, the commander of JG3, and that, of course, is Ernst Udet. Bongartz now has a glass eye, which stands out conspicuously, and to my eyes, he still appears rather thin and, and hollow-faced. However, if you're worried that Bongartz remained gaunt and anorexic his entire <laughs> life, don't be. <laughs> Here's Bongartz in the late 1920s. These were taken at a gathering of surviving Blue Max airmen, most of them naturally now in the Luftwaffe. And this is Bongartz and Udet and Bruno Lortzer, who still looks pretty fit. Bongartz and Udet both put on a bit of weight as they got older, uh, something that happens to many of us, as I know from experience. Bongartz died of a heart attack in 1946. Well, we'd better get back to 1918 and look at another interesting character, Rudolf Klimka of Yasta 27. In contrast to Bongartz, Klimka was a little guy, short, with a square face and a pug nose, which may be why he's trying to look as menacing as possible in this famous <laughs> photo. 
He'd gone to war as a 23-year-old with a field artillery regiment, but switched to aviation in August 1915. He flew with FFA 55 on the Eastern Front for almost a year, and where he and his observer, Oberleutnant Leon, or Leon, shot down a Russian plane in September. Both of them were then transferred to Flieger Optilung 19 in Flanders. Klimka had taught himself night flying in Russia, and now he and his observer made many nighttime bombing raids into enemy lines. Entirely on his own initiative, he conceived the idea of a nighttime flight across the channel to bomb London in his Albatross two-seater. He obtained permission from his unit commander, and on the night of the 6th of May, 1917, Klimka and Leon navigated their way to London and dropped five 10-kilogram bombs on the city. After a four-hour flight, they returned and were celebrated as having made the first nighttime London raid by a heavier-than-air craft. His success got him posted to Staffel 13 of KG-3, Kampfgeschrader 3, to fly Gotha bombers. He took part in the famous daylight raid on London on 7 July 1917, and he and his crew were even given credit for downing and attacking Sopwith. However, Klimka disliked flying the big cumbersome bombers, and soon returned to his old unit, he eventually transferred to fighters and arrived at Yasta 27 on September 12, 1917. He got his first two confirmed victories as a single-seater pilot only two weeks later, two on the same day. Well, Klimka shot down two SE-5s in February and March 1918 to bring his tally to seven, and by May he was flying this triplane. It displayed a black anchor on the tail, which was repeated on the fuselage, probably in yellow. If you look closely, you can just pick out the, the anchor right there. It's not a very good photo. Now, why would Klimke, who had no naval connections, favor an anchor as a personal emblem? Klimke lived to a ripe old age of 96, and he was interviewed by Alex Emery late in life. Most of our knowledge of Klimke comes from Alex's interviews. Alex knew that the old gentleman had lost all of his photos in World War II. So, Alex took along many of his own photos relating to Yasta 27 in hopes of jogging the old gent's memory. Among them was this classic official photo of Yasta 27 triplanes from May of 1918. Alex thought the pilot of the foremost triplane was Klimka himself. He showed this photo to the elderly flyer who hadn't seen it in many years. The old gent immediately piped up and exclaimed, There I am, with my little button nose. The anchor on the tail is just, just visible, and with close scrutiny on an original print, you can make out the anchor on the fuselage. Because of his short stature, Klimka used a lap strap for personal safety, rather than the usual shoulder strap harness, and this allowed him easier access to the guns and didn't restrict his movements to check six behind him. Well, Klimka revealed the reason for the anchor insignia to Alex. He used this emblem at the insistence of his mother since she believed it symbolized Gute Hoffnung, or good hope. And she maintained that no harm would come to her son if he carried this device on his airplanes. Where did she get that idea? Well, you may be familiar with the Christian theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity. In German, they're usually given as Glaube, Liebe, and Hoffnung in various orders. For ages, these three virtues have been symbolized by a cross for faith, a heart for charity, and an anchor for hope. So that's where it came from. This is Russell Smith's magnificent painting, Yellow Jackets, showing Klimka's triplane bearing his protective talisman. He continued to score throughout December of 1918 and eventually switched to a Fokker D7 along with the rest of the unit. By the 9th of August, Klimka's score stood at 13. One of his victories was in Newport 28 on the 20th of July which was downed as part of a fight we might call 27 versus 27, for it pitted Yasta 27 against the American 27th Aero Squadron. Later today, we're going to hear about Frank Luke from Stephen Skinner, and the 27th was Luke's outfit, although this was some time before Luke's famous exploits. Five Yasta 27 Fokker pilots, including the aces Rudolf Klimke, Wilhelm Neuenhofen, and Friedrich Noltenius, engaged five Newports. Noltenius wrote that the Yas-27 pilots had seen they were being observed by an enemy pursuit group, and they calmly lured them into attacking us. He wrote that 
Neuenhofen had been attacked by three opponents. He had caught one and shot him down, or rather he forced him down. I saw Klimka following another machine, and I joined them. Judging from the pennant on his tail, this must have been the leader of the enemy squadron. We forced him down. The Newport prepared for a landing, but somersaulted in the process. We were over our own territory. Five of them attacked us, and two were shot down. Actually, it was three. Uh, Zenos Miller, one of Mike's New Jersey friends, came down unhurt and was taken prisoner. And Mike wrote an excellent article about Miller in Over the Front, Volume 11. Fred Norton, DSC, there, was hit in the chest and right arm, but managed to fly over the lines and crash in the trenches. He died three days later. Lieutenant John MacArthur, I don't have a photo of him, fell badly wounded behind German lines and died on the, 90, on the, on the 4th, 9th of August. The Germans were only credited with two victories. Klimka flew the D-7 glimpsed in the background of this photo, and Harry Dempsey and I reconstructed the markings as shown, although this is very provisional. You can't really see what's, it's what we strain to see on the fuselage. Okay, Klimka's protective anger emblem, the anchor emblem, was in the end only partially successful. On the 21st of September, Klimka downed a camel for his 17th victory and then attacked some DH-4s. He was then severely wounded. His squadron comrade, Noltenius, wrote that Klimka had been wounded, but he safely returned to the base. During an attack on two-seaters, he'd been hit in a mysterious manner. He was hit three times in the shoulder. Klimka was soon safe in a field hospital, or so he thought. He received further life-threatening injuries when the hospital was hit by Allied bombers. But, once again, he cheated death, as we know. And I have to relate one more story I heard from Alex Emery. While Alex's research benefited greatly from his meetings with many old veterans, he said the elder, uh, elderly gentleman's recollections were occasionally a little confused, and one had to be careful. During his few, first interview with Rudolf Klimke, the old eagle had stated that the nimble British fighter planes he had scrapped with in 1918 were <coughs> spitfires. <laughs> when Alex gently tried to correct him, Klimke said something to the effect of, don't tell me I'm wrong, I was there. Well, Alex eventually convinced him of the facts. We've heard a few quotes from the Yasa 27 pilot, Friedrich Noltenius, and he's a most fascinating character. The son of a medical professor from Bremen, Noltenius was engaged in, in his own medical studies when the war came, and he went off to battle in the field artillery in 1914 at the age of 20. After distinguished service on both the eastern and western fronts, he transferred to the flying service in November 1917. He breezed through his training, he was obviously brilliant, and was soon posted to a two-seater unit for artillery spotting duties. He must have made a great impression, for after only a week in a two-seater unit, he was posted to a Yasta school for fighter pilot training. It's very unusual. He joined Yasta 27 in mid-July 1918. Noltenius kept a very detailed and perceptive diary of his time as a fighter pilot. In 1966, historian Ed Furco obtained the diary from Noltenius's widow and translated it for publication in Cross and Cockade, Volume 7. It's really a very remarkable and important document. He was an excellent writer. Noltenius's Fokkers were all marked with a version of the flag of his home city, the free Hanseatic city of Bremen. On this particular Yasta 27 OAW built D7, the red and white stripes were marked on the fuselage and on the center of the top wing. And here's a top view of what the D7 probably looked like. Upon his posting to Yasta 27, Noltenius began planning to make attacks on observation balloons. Just like Frank Luke, he planned his attacks with great care and detail and forethought. Of his 21 confirmed victories, eight were balloons. Noltenius achieved his first confirmed kill on the 10th of August, when he found himself beneath a flight of six Southwood Dolphins of 87 squad. He, he wrote, The second plane immediately dived at me. His shots missed me, and he dived away. 
I immediately put myself at his heels, and, he went, and we went downward like crazy. The pilot turned his head, saw me, and at once put his machine in a vertical dive. I followed him and was once more in firing position at very close range. I fired, passed him, flew a turn, and so I'm lining on his back, hard north of Puseau. Noltenius's diary provides details of other units in JG3 as well as his own. On August 19th, he wrote, Stoffel 36 got Fokker parasols, and we got 11 new engines for our D7s. Now, we knew that Yasta 36 had acquired some Fokker E5 monoplanes, but the diary provides the exact date. In each of the three JGs, one Yasta of the four was selected to receive the revolutionary-looking new parasol monoplanes. This new photo reveals a whole lineup of Yasta 36 E5s. Yasta 36, by the way, had been saddled with its obsolete Fokker triplanes for far too long after the other units got Fokker D7s, and they were in dire need of better aircraft. Each plane displays the Stoffel's blue nose and personal markings on the fuselage. Now, if you take a look at the third one in line right there, you can just make out an arrow marking similar to what we saw on the earlier triplane. And they were certainly flown by the same pilot. Once again, thank you. Jim Miller provided the, the wonderful color profile. Alex Emery wrote that the Yasta 36 pilots who flew the E5 considered them blenden, which means dazzling or brilliant. This no doubt refers to their climb and maneuverability. However, Yasta 36 did not get to fly their new planes for long. I should point out that this is not a Yasta 36 E5. Rather, this one is from Yasta 19 of JG2, and it's the plane of Ernst Riedel, who was killed in this crash because of wing failure, the, the Achilles heel of the early E5s, during a test flight on the 16th of August, three days before, three days before Yasta 36 got their monoplanes. On August 19th, the same day that the E5s arrived at Yasta 36, a Yasta 6 pilot in, in JG-1 Richthofen was killed in a similar crash of his E-5. These fatalities resulted in an immediate grounding of the type, pending a thorough investigation. Though Yasta 36 had time to paint up their pretty monoplanes, I don't think they were probably ever able to make much use of them. However, Yasta 36 retained some E-5s until mid-September, but I doubt that they were ever really flown much. On 14 September, Noltenius made what became his most famous balloon attack. And some of you are very familiar with John Gutman Knows Everything, but anyway. <laughs> he wrote about this in his diary, and he also wrote another version several years later, and I'll quote from both accounts. With the engine throttled back, I flew deeper and deeper into enemy territory until I was in a position behind the balloons. I started my dive, pulled in the direction of the balloon and in front of the balloon, until I was a bit lower, and then pulled up to lose speed. If the prop revved too fast, there was danger of the bullets hitting the propellers. As soon as I was on the same level with the balloon, I applied full throttle and headed towards it. At a distance of 300 meters, I began to fire and closed in, firing continuously. I only needed to press the attack home when suddenly, while I was a mere 50 meters away, a gigantic flame rose which completely engulfed me. The shock hurled me away. I at once took course for the lines after I discovered that the machine was still in flying condition. But what a shamble she was. The cloth covering had become completely slack all over the machine and billowed. There was no resistance to the controls, and there were big pieces of balloon fabric everywhere in the struts and tail. The metal sheets of the engine cowlings were bashed in, their propeller charred, my beautiful painted insignia blown off by the explosion, the fabric covering brittle like tinder and torn loose in many places. Even my leather cap had been singed. What had become of my youthful Fokker, <coughs> a tired, asthmatic old man covered with ulcers? <laughs> I slowly took a course toward home at half throttle. I was able to land safely on our field. The single gain was large shreds of the English balloon, which were hanging about on the struts and tail. 
It was good rubberized fabric, but unfortunately, not enough to make a raincoat. <laughs> In blockaded Germany, that stuff was scarce. Noltenius was convinced that the British had laid a trap for him and with explosives and balloon in the balloon. Many of you know that that's how they got the famous balloon buster von Eschwege in the Balkans. That's never been confirmed in this case, however. Meanwhile, with their Fokker monoplanes grounded and left with their old triplanes in 1D7, Yasta 36 was in desperate need of combat-worthy airplanes. This photo was taken in September 1918 and it shows one tired old triplane, but this over here and this and that are components of Fokker E5s, which they probably couldn't fly at all. But their situation was about to get even worse. On the 17th of September, Noltenius wrote, When I awoke in the morning, I heard the noise of engines, flat fire, and the high whine of the English machines. Fourteen SE5s and Southwiths attacked our airfield with bombs and MG fire. The Raiders were from 64 and 209 Squadron and dropped 91 bombs. Noltenius wrote, A tent of Yasta 36 was set aflame, while another one was virtually riddled with bullets. Three airplanes burned, a triplane, a parasol, and a D-7. And this remarkable new photo shows precisely that scene. And you can just make out, this is a Fokker E-5, this is what's left of a triplane, and this is a D7, a few slides and wings right there. Um, even before this, Yasta 36 had not really been operational due to an aircraft shortage. Now, they only had one operational airplane left. One week later, on the 24th of September, Yasta 36 finally received a few D7s. The next day, an Altenius was transferred to Yasta 6 in JG-1, and his detailed accounts of the JG-3 come to an end. This view shows a lineup of Yasta 36 D-7s, but even some of these were soon lost due to attrition, the usual stuff. The Yasta 36 war diary reveals that finally, on the 4th of October, Yasta 36 re received some false D-12s. But even these had had their engines fouled by dirty, used oil and required extensive maintenance before they could be used. The, the Yasta 36 war diary sadly reported, the Staffel has had a great deal of bad luck. It was not until October 26th that Yasta 36 was finally once again able to fly sorties with their false D-12s and D-7s. Uh, this is while the other three units were really going to town shooting down a lot of planes. This unique photo shows the false D-12 of the unit commander, Lieutenant Theodor Quant, and the fellow is an NCO pilot named Hüller. Well, the final day of combat for JG-3 was November 4th, 1918. On that day, all four Staffeln contributed to the tally of 13 enemy planes down. Among the victors were Lieutenant Steger of Yasta 36, who brought down a Bristol fighter for his second victory. This is Steger's impressive albatross-built Fokker D-7, named Ethel. It's a heck of a picture, along with a member of his ground crew. In October and November 1918, JG-3 had been in a nearly constant state of retreat from one airfield to another. On November 8th, three days before the armistice, the hard luck unit Yasta 36 suffered one final indignity. As the unit was making one last transfer from Lens to Lierma, most of their false D-12s could not be flown out due to bad weather. So what did they do? They burned eight false, just burned them there to keep them from falling into the enemy's hands. Two more of their aircraft did manage to take <coughs> off but were destroyed in crash landings. Then came the armistice. After recording some 370 victories, the proud airmen of JG-3 were ordered to fly their D-7s to the British airfield and Nivelle in Belgium to hand them over to the Allies. Many pilots were furious about this, but discipline prevailed, and they flew their Fokkers to the collection center in perfect formation. They landed smoothly and taxied up to the waiting Allied commission officers, 
who noticed that each D7 bore a chalked inscription on its side. And Yastabolka's commander, Carl Bola, wrote, The handover followed. Each aircraft carried the glorious name of its pilot and the number of his victories. Thus, they gave witness to the deeds which were accomplished with them. Thank you very much.